Next presentation is also um, from uh, a colleague from Facebook uh, of the previous presenters. It's about the, uh, uh, I always have to make sure I say it right. It's not the cellular community manager, it's the community cellular manager, um, uh, which complements, of course, the, the open cellular hardware that was just being described. I hand over to Omar. Thank you. Uh, so talking to you about community cellular manager, now, what it does, it's a tool that empowers individuals and communities to uh, set up and maintain their own network infrastructure. It ties together a stack like Osmocom um, and gives you uh, voice services, user management, billing, network monitoring, and a simple way to integrate with the PSTN. So what does it do? Uh, it's a solution that reduces the technical requirements necessary to deploy uh, a network, uh, a mobile network. We've been through, we're, we're, this is a fairly technical audience over here, and even looking at all the configs, it's like hard to keep track, but imagine putting this out in uh, a community. You know, we want, we want to abstract away what it takes to actually uh, operate a network on the day-to-day, -day. So uh, when receiving this box on the field, a community member, all they have to do is um, take a, the hardware serial ID and put it into a dashboard. Um, so there's a cloud component and a client-side component that sit in CCM. They put it into the dashboard and... Um, automatically the device will start pulling configurations and uh, start providing voice, SMS, and data services. So um, the client-side application uh, has local breakout. It, it runs on NIDB and uh, can provide uh, local services that are disconnected. And it uses the cloud for managing your billing and... Uh, looking at network KPIs, um, notifying for downtime, looking at usage trends, and also it's a multi-tenant system, so this is meant to be providing a, a core as a service for network operators, and the operator of the cloud infrastructure can charge an interconnect fee. So this model has... Um, implications in that it reduces the operating costs of actually running and maintaining a network. There's like built-in auto reset systems that detect outages. And um, it has been um, deployed in rural communities and running for a few years right now. Um, and the operating costs that um, it enables allow us to economically uh, sustainably deploy networks that are economically sustainable. Um, where we wouldn't be able to do that with traditional centralized networks. So CCM was de de designed with a, uh, a few set of criteria and use cases. Uh, we wanted to be able to operate our networks on standard commercial satellite links because enterprise ones are so expensive. So the problem with that is that backhaul goes down all the time. So we wanted to be able to still provide services and allow these network operators to continue running their businesses, even if the backhaul is unreliable. So all the functionality of the network actually sits on the edge. And we have things like local SMS applications that can continue to work. So retailers can send, still sell credit, um, even if the network is down. And um, when outbound you're sending outbound messages. Those are queued for delivery as soon as we reconnect. Uh, so the basic day-to-day -day operations are not severely impacted with network outages. Uh, the other thing is that we want to make it really easy to interconnect to uh, carriers. In the cloud, we have uh, the ability to interconnect with VOIP providers like Nexmo, but we've also done carrier interconnects. So the cloud provides the interconnection inter 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 and uh, the B a BSS, OSS-like functionality. So whenever one of these clients is connected to uh, 
the cloud infrastructure, they can send outbound uh, traffic. Um, and it also synchronizes with the cloud to um, replicate subscriber information for business purposes, um, upload device metrics so you can tell if your network's healthy. Um, and has a very small footprint. It synchronizes every minute with this ping messages around 500, uh, 500 bytes of traffic. And the last use case we wanted to support was cross-site uh, connectivity. So if I'm a network operator, I'm running a business, and I have a number of communities that I'm covering, I can give one set of SIM cards and build my credit transfer infrastructure around all these communities, and people can move from one community to the next seamlessly, uh, and the HLRs are synchronized across all, all sites. It can even operate without an internet connection, as long as these different sites are on the same network. And as soon as, um, like, things like subscriber balances can get out of sync when you're using on one network and going to another and there's no, no backhaul, but we use, uh, it's designed with that in mind, but when it connects back to the cloud, it will eventually reach consensus. And there's no roaming. So this is different from, like, real roaming. There's no 3GPP roaming and carrier, um, carriers can't, other carriers can't use this network. So there are two major components in CCM. The uh, first is the client, which does uh, all this local breakout, caching of messages, um, auto support, and you know, auto remediation during downtime. Um, and there's the cloud. So the client can run on a variety of different uh, radio gear. Uh, actually, can run embedded in open cellular gear, the new RAN 1.5. And uh, we even have it running on Fairwaves gear. So uh, this is how it's sort of broken down. All traffic into the network is carried over a VPN to mitigate uh, some of the tr network uh, address translation issues that you run into with VOIP, and also to offer some level of security. We have a service that uh, manages subscriber presence. It uses the new GSUP implementation for uh, the HLR and allows us to extract location updates and um, all signaling from the, from the network. And we can take this information and synchronize it uh, upstream. And it also provides a generic interface. It uses protobufs, um, and it provides uh, a, an RPC for other applications on the system to access subscriber data, regardless of what language it's implemented in. There are a few services that manage the client. We have a soft switch for directing all VoIP and SMS traffic, it uses Osmo SIP connector and a free switch SMPP extension. And uh, using some um, Python scripts, it talks to the subscriber DB, queries things like balance, can we make calls, should we send it out of the network, or which base station should we send it to? Um, and Daga D is managing device registration and lifecycle. It does these periodic pings every minute. It will also do um, life, like you know, sort of like uh, health checks on the base station every minute. And if it detects that we haven't been providing service for the past four minutes, number of subscribers has dropped to zero. It'll perform, perform an auto reboot of all services uh, to restore connectivity. And um, the last service is Federer. It's a server. Um, and it handles all inbound um, push notifications from the cloud, things like uh, messages that need to be delivered immediately um, and actions that we need to perform for management, like restarting a service or um, so forth. So those are the, the outbound interfaces for the clients. Um, it all runs on top of Python and Daga core, and that abstracts away portions of the GSM network, giving you access to things like subscribers, uh, BTS configuration, 
um, SMS composing from plain text and handling all the transcoding for you. Um, abstracts it into modules that uh, can be implemented on top of like Sysmocom. So we have a Python library that can speak with the VTY, um, which you shouldn't be doing, control interface. <laughs> um, so um, it manages the NIDB stack that way and pulls out uh, load information and uh, other usage information from the NIDB, which gets synchronized back to the dashboard. So it's a collection of packages that you could download. We're actually hosting them for uh, Debian and Ubuntu. Just install this uh, this uh, set of packages, and like you can run it in a VM. And every device has its own unique identifier. Oops, I don't know where my second screen is. Oh, there it is. Okay, so you have, this is the device unique ID, and I can connect it to the dashboard. Oop. Bottom left. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay, there, there we go. So here's my tower. This is all in a VM. And I see it's active. I can see the subscribers on the network. So their presence, which base station they've been last been seen on. Their balance, uh, usage in the network, uh, and activity. <laughs> so on the cloud side, uh, there's a few tiers of service that um, handle traffic and management. The first is Indaga Web that exposes the GUI that I just showed you, as well as a bunch of APIs that the clients in the fields can check in with. Um, there is, that, that's just written in Django. There's also a self-organizing module component. So when you actually deploy a new site, uh, it records it in a database. You can request a set of channels in a location um, that haven't been registered. So you can do your own network planning there. Um, there are tiers for uh, voice and the interconnect with operators. It's just free switch. Um, and it has some logic to determine which route uh, or which base station to send traffic or, or an incoming call uh, to based off of the subscriber number. Um, we use Canal for SMS. You can also use Nexmo. Um, and then we have an async tier. So another big problem with communicating with uh, clients in the field is that they go down all the time. So we queue messages for delivery uh, using um, asynchronous jobs, and it will retry to deliver messages until they come back online. Now, uh, this is all deployable in a VM, this entire infrastructure, you can test out everything, or you can deploy it on Amazon Web Services and there's stuff in the repo to automatically do that for you. So, as I mentioned, there's a few industry partners that have started implementing this, um, and we are rolling it out with Globe in the Philippines. We have a uh, trial deployment over there. So, um, yeah, it's a very active project. Um, if you want to use portions of it, there's a GitHub repo. Um, so development on it 
you don't need any hardware. The only thing I'd recommend is 16 gigabytes of RAM or more because there's a lot of VMs. Um, but you can virtualize the, uh, the radio component and test everything else out. But uh, it works great with the Sysmo BTS. It's like configured to work out of the box with that. I'll try to set up a demo later. So future work, um, there is a lot of work we're doing on building out like role-based access on the cloud and uh, allowing more of a business organization to um, manage a network, have a dedicated person doing uh, you know, network configuration who doesn't have access to subscriber data, for instance. Uh, we're also building out data billing. So we do have data support, uh, but we want to be able to enable and disable traffic selectively for individual subscribers and build them for it, um, and enable uh, the ciphering of, of calls. So there's ongoing work, plenty of ways to contribute back, and happy to help anyone get set up on the stack, and open it for questions if there are any. Okay, thanks, Omar. Do we have questions? And if so, from where? Back there. Uh, yes, I have a question uh, regarding uh, HLR synchronization. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you synchronize HLRs in the case uh, when you have several sites uh, in one network? Good question. Um, we use a, um, a data structure called um, CRDTs, which um, allow you to maintain multiple ledgers across base stations. So you're recording traffic for um, which base station you've been on, and um, every single time you reconnect to the network, these balances get recon recon uh, they get uh, consolidated, and um, they they reach uh, a terminal state. So it's like the data structure is mathematically designed in a way that um, it will reach consensus regardless of when you sync them together. I guess uh, the source code is out, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, more questions. I think there was one more question back. I didn't, didn't no, no questions. Well, well, okay, yeah. Peter first. I just want to know what a uh, license you've released this under. It's BSD. Straight BSD. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Nils was first. Okay. Yeah. Straight BSD was the patent grant from Facebook, like used in other projects. Um, there is a patent clause. Um, shoot. This is way zoomed in. But, I don't even know what it says. I guess you're not the lawyer. No. <laughs> um, yeah, additional grant of patents, yeah. Um, yes. It looks like that. Um, and there, there is a lice contributor agreement that you have, if you want to upstream changes, um, it's like, yeah, we waive liability and things of that nature, but you're free yeah. to use it and do so, what you want with it. I would like to know if you do anything to optimize the bandwidth uh, on the uplink, the satellite uplink, yes. or you just uh, pass RTP uh, in the VPN? Um, we do two sets of optimizations. Um, so we transcode um, traffic into, um, I can't remember which codec. I'll have to look at it. We, we do transcode at, at the, um, at the edge and 
and I send it back to the cloud uh, and re-encode to whatever our interconnect needs. Uh, other thing we do is our check-ins. We only send incremental updates. So um, if there's a configuration that's coming down from the cloud, we only send the value that's changed. Um, and we only synchronize subscriber information that's changed. So um, proto, proto buffers have uh, field masks that you can use to, to send selected fields. Um, but the proto buffers are not used for things like configuration. Um, so eventually everything will get to proto buff. This is a new, um, it's a new RPC that we're using, but everything was designed over HTTP in the beginning. So we have our own delta compression algorithm and then we, we compress all the traffic. Yeah, so just in general, uh, why does Google build self-driving cars? Why does, can you say something about why does Facebook build uh, GSM infrastructure? We believe in building tools for, um, you know, individuals to communicate with each other. We want to make the world a more open and connected place. And this infrastructure has gotten cheap to the point that it's possible for communities to uh, offer services themselves that they have not been offered by uh, incumbent carriers. So by all means, it falls on to, under what we're trying to do um, and get more people uh, communicating. Maybe um, sort of a comment to that. As far as I understand, there's no intention of Facebook to be operating any of this, right? It's, it's Certainly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just to be clear on that, yeah. Okay, more questions? Okay, well, thank you then, Omar.